Yeah, I'd like to welcome you to this uh, video. Sorry that I am not be able to come to Moscow this year, uh, but it was just a, a matter of time. Um, so I hope um, I can also tell you something with uh, this video about uh, digitalization and higher education. My talk will be about uh, higher education. Let's go. My name itself is Martin Ebner. I'm from Graz University of Technology and I'm currently the head of the so-called Educational Technology Department. Um, we are responsible for all the e-learning activities of the university. We have about uh, 17,000 students, um, 2,000 lecturers, and we are a typical university of technology. We have uh, seven faculties uh, from architecture to computer science. Um, in this slide, you can just see um, where you can contact me. I have a website, I'm on Facebook, I'm on Twitter, uh, whatever. If you have any questions afterwards, um, you're highly welcome to write me on any channel you find me. Yes, and uh, second, um, I have also um, a so-called feedback system running in the background. That means uh, if you're taking uh, this URL right now uh, with your mobile phone, your smartphone, tablet, or whatever device you have with you, uh, you can give me feedback. Um, this feedback is not uh, instantly, but I will read it um, more or less uh, during the day, and uh, I will sh uh, check how I can answer it to you. So feel free to give me feedback to any slide, or if you have any question, just leave it uh, within the tool. In the beginning, I would like to just ask you one question. Do you know what the so-called red flag acts are? Have you ever heard about it? And um, I'm sure um, if I explain it to you, you can remember to that. And uh, for me, it was a very important thing. Because uh, during the invention of the car, uh, maybe you remember a man has to go in front of this car with a red flag. And uh, in the background, the car has to drive. And uh, of course, if the man is, is going, it must be rather slow. And the red flag acts are the uh, written in the Wikipedia, if you are going there. It's the most draconic restrictions and speed limits were imposed by the 1865 Act, the so-called Red Flag Act, which required all road locomotives, it's what not, not cars there, which included automobiles to travel at a maximum of far four miles per hour in the country and two miles per hour in the city, as well as requiring a man carrying uh, this red flag uh, to walk in front of road vehicles holding multiple wagons. So, uh, if you think um, today, it would be rather ridiculous to say, what, uh, we have a car, we cannot go from A to B within uh, a speed of uh, 100 miles per hour or something like that. And um, of course, um, we cannot imagine that there is mobility happen if just a man is going in front of the car. And um, But if you remember, that was the time where the car, the um, road locomotives were invented. There were horses and the humanity just can't imagine what happened if we are driving faster. And they can't imagine that uh, is needed to uh, to drive faster because their mobility was just uh, in 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 this two miles per hour. Yeah, and um, what happened after that? We invented the infrastructures, the streets. We get teachers who show you how to drive a car, for example. We um, made rules, specifications, instructions, and we reached a high mobility with the car. It's just over the time. And today, a life without car is n not really possible anymore because we need it uh, for different many things. And we are currently discussing about autonomous driving. And um, that is very interesting because um, that was the reason, um, or there's always the same pro problem of innovations. We cannot imagine what happened because we are not living with this uh, kind of technology. And uh, my thing is uh, that digital technologies are much more complex than just cars. And uh, we cannot imagine what happened maybe in 20, 40, 100 years because of digital technologies. Um, 
I also attend the so-called Concil, an educational Concil in Heldenberg 2017, where we have uh, just thinking for three days in different rooms uh, with different people from different um, companies, uh, educational institutions, and so on. And uh, our hypothesis after the three days was, in the age of artificial intelligence, robots, virtual reality, autonomous driving, even virtual sex and exploding digital applications, we need a so-called digital major and responsible citizens. That means um, that our education has to go there. So what we need is people who understand how digitalization happens, what is in the background, in behind. They have not just to become programmers, they have to understand all these things. And uh, this is what we uh, mean with digital major and responsible citizens. Okay, in the terms of higher education, I would like to provide you four questions and hopefully also four answers who are from my point of perspective are very important. The first thing is, uh, the first question, why do we need educational technologies urgently? So why we can't wait for that? And uh, my answer is just uh, think about the students of today. What we are doing at uh, Graz University of Technology, we are making the so-called welcome days. Welcome days means uh, that our freshmen, our beginners are coming on the really first day at the university and we have welcome days where we just uh, welcome them and explain them the most important things they need for their uh, life of study. And what we are also doing is we gather our um, feedback as well as making a short evaluation and making a survey. A survey um, concentrating on the digital habits, um, what uh, the people are currently own and how they are living uh, from the perspective of uh, digital technology. And we have now a 12-year-old uh, long-term study. That means I have done it for uh, 12 years now. And uh, you see I have uh, more than uh, nearly 10,000 students attending to this survey. And what is the result? There is one question that means which device do you own? It's just this question. I just want to know uh, which kind of devices uh, did the students own. You see yellow is in the year 2007 and the next yellow point is in 2018. So, so um, uh, abroad this time. Uh, the most important thing is that um, all of our students, more than 100% now, owns a smartphone. A mobile phone, of course, and um, this means in Austria, for sure, they have also a so-called flat rate uh, with internet access because it's rather cheap to them. From these mobile phones, most of them are Android ones um, because they are cheaper and um, they are more than just iPhones. The rest is iPhone and you see there is no less more no Windows mobile phones. That's very important for our university because we know if we're making mobile applications then we have to provide it for Android as well as for iOS. Yeah, we also were asking for portable power packs, so that they are increasing more than 50% of our students own this. You see in, there's an increase of the internet uh, television, I will make Netflix and co. And what is also interesting is that of course uh, the iPod we have uh, in 2000, you see, is just decreasing, nearly no one have an iPod anymore and no one have an, an MP3 player because of the mobile phone of course. Also interesting is that uh, nearly 80% of my students own a personal desktop computer as, and uh, more than 60 to 70% also a laptop. So that means they are very highly equipped. Um, um, it's a generation who is so highly equipped as no generation before. Um, maybe interesting for you is also the, the part of the e-reader. An uh, e-reader is um, just increasing slowly uh, because that is very important for the university uh, in the terms of a question, um, should we also provide uh, EPUB files or something like that. The second question is uh, the communication strategy. So how, the, how do you com communicate on a daily or more or less uh, regular basis? Mm -hmm. And um, here uh, you can see that um, Email was uh, the number one in 2007, uh, just followed by short messages services, SMS. And um, SMS is 
decreasing dramatically. You see there are only 40% uh, who are telling us they are using SMS anymore. And also email is decreasing yeah, up to 80% of the students. But um, what was uh, increasing very dramatically was uh, in Facebook and were in the in the year between 2008 and 2009 we have this increase within one year this was the very uh, first surprise in the study because it was an increase you see from more than uh, nearly 60 percent within one year so this was uh, I was uh, told uh, that or, um, spoken about that this is the Facebook generation is coming. Facebook is decreasing dramatically, you see. It's a decreasing part as well. And the second uh, big surprise in this uh, diagram is uh, that WhatsApp was happening in 2014. Yeah, You see there is an increase from more or less null percent to 80% just within one year. This kind of uh, students were coming to our university and it was the arrival of the WhatsApp generation. Currently it's a little bit decreasing, but you see also that email lost uh, against Facebook in the year 2016. So in 2016 this was clearly the number one uh, communication channel for the students is WhatsApp. Currently a little bit decreasing because of the security discussions and so on. And you see that there's a uh, things like uh, Telegram or something like that are just uh, increasing. Interesting is maybe also uh, in terms of Skype. Skype is dramatically decreasing um, and all the other messenger services um, increasing. So it's just vice versa. And uh, very funny is uh, the Twitter generation. You see there is no real Twitter uh, within the students. Uh, it's just uh, for more or less some important people on this world. Yeah, and then we are asking uh, for the social media usage. So many teachers and lecturers are coming to me and say, okay, uh, you tell me there are so important uh, communication channels. Which communication channel should we use uh, for teaching or um, lecturing? And then we make a so-called clustering analysis. That means that we try to combine people who are, who are using or who are behaving the same. And if you combine these people within the study, you see a very interesting fact. You see, for example, they, there is a yellow group. Um, a yellow group means they are not using any communication tool at all. No? So it doesn't matter if you need WhatsApp, Facebook or whatever. And all the others, um, there you see that um, whether, for example, WhatsApp is very high, iCloud is very high, Facebook is very high. Um, that means if you combine and you um, make a study about the behavior of the people, then you uh, recognize there are people who are discussing always and anywhere, in any channel, and there are people who are not discussing. So it is not, the answer is not uh, just use this tool. Uh, the answer is you have to use a tool and the people will talk with you. Um, it doesn't matter which kind of tool. Um, maybe you can also choose Telegram or whatever, and uh, students will be able to communi communicate with you. So the second uh, or the first answer of the first question, why do we need um, it's, uh, this digitalization so urgently, is that the use of media for learning purposes is normal in everyday life for our today's young people. It's a more or less an integral part of the learning environment. It's a kind of daily routine. So the students who are coming to us are just, uh, it's part of their daily life. And uh, therefore it's important that also we as lecturers, we as university are going to provide um, these possibilities. And um, we are also uh, tell, also asking students, what do you expect from the university? And they tell, told us students need a comprehensive central offer of digital accessible learning tools and content. So they're always telling us we just want to have one important place and not uh, millions of websites and, and something like that. She would like to have a central place where they get all the learning content and learning tools. The second question. The second question is, um, how do we enhance universities with their, is education technologies? Because we see in the first question there is a need. Yeah? And it's the second question, how we can do that. And um, therefore, we have a very long um, discussion survey uh, within uh, our university, with the staff, with the lecturers, and so on. And uh, they provide us these four things. 
what they expect from educational technology. They said, uh, if we are using media or new media or technologies, we have to benefit from that. So we need a clear benefit if I take any tool. That is uh, the first reason when I would like to use technologies. Then if I um, take this tool, it should be have a very high usability. So it should be easy to use, um, easy to understand. And um, because of course the lecturer would like to lecture and not to concentrate on the tool. And uh, we have to provide a very good infrastructure because it should be smoothly fast and so on so it must run and up and not down and the fourth point is also very interesting we would like to have rules templates how we have to use this technology yeah? so because they have the problem they have to take this tool very fast um, they have to decide to take it and then they would like to know how should they use and what is the didactical concept in behind they need something of templates and this um, we are calling the so-called success factors for lecturers and uh, currently we try to concentrate uh, really on this four points to get educational technology running uh, in our university. So, and I think there are three points. Um, if you are talking about the university, so what sh should we do from a strategic point of view? The first is we have to strengthen the didactical trainings. Yeah, that means uh, three points. Uh, we have to train the media pedagogy, yeah? the media didactics, that means how should I use the media, and on educational technology itself, because I, I have also to um, to work with this educational technology and there should be no, no failure or something like that. Yeah? Then uh, if we trained the teachers, we need an organizational anchoring of online teaching. So we have, for example, in uh, Middle Europe, the problem that is not really typical to make online teaching and there is no law in behind. So we have um, teaching and learning organization, we have to do something there. And we have to create also learning spaces where this new form of uh, online learning can happen. And of course, we have to provide the needed infrastructure. It costs money, of course. Yeah, so the second thing is, the second question is, uh, the whole university must be competent in terms of media usage for teaching and learning. That, that must be the goal. So we have the students who would like to have that and we have the lecturer we are, we are now competent. And the this leads to the um, second or uh, third question. We need, of course, digital content. Um, it doesn't make any sense if you have all these uh, competent teachers and uh, students and we did not have real digital content. And that's also a problem because uh, we have, at least in Middle Europe, a very strict copyright law. Um, and this copyright law did not allow us uh, to use uh, even free content of the web for education and for lecturing because there is the copyright law on that and we have to ask to get uh, the permission permission yeah that means that it's a problem yeah because uh, then um, we must ask the question uh, it doesn't make any sense to use digital um, devices if i have no content on that or i'm not allowed to use this content and therefore um, we are always talking about the so-called open culture the open culture you maybe know from the open source uh, idea you maybe also know the open access idea that uh, anyone should provide the research results uh, also public for the humanity and uh, there is also the term open education resources that means uh, that we have also tried to get educational content um, openly or freely on the web uh, so we can use it for lecturing and uh, per definition, open education resources, as so OER, are any type of educational materials that are in the public domain or introduced with an open license. And um, that is the main part. It's not only free available on the web, but it's also there on it a uh, license who allow to work and that means the nature of this open material means that anyone can legally and freely copy use adapt and reshare them and then of course we can work with these educational materials the students the lecturers we can cooperate between universities and so on and uh, this means it is a strategical implementation from the university because it just says that any teachers should 
if possible, his learning content as open education resources. And if we are doing all universities um, on this direction, then we can exchange all the materials without any law problems or something like that. That's the idea. Yeah, and you see, for example, we are using, of course, uh, the Creative uh, Commons licenses. Um, and um, even sometimes people are also using an open standard uh, tool, for example, open office, so that is also not restricted by application. Though this third answer of the question is concerning the learning content, we have to open our content to ensure accessibility, exchange, or simply digital based education. Because uh, without any content, you will not be able to teach. And um, But um, the main question is not any university has to do it all content on his own. It must be maybe more efficient if you just exchange the content. And uh, then we can produce uh, it may maybe with more quality. Yeah, the fourth uh, question is, um, or the finally, um, we have now... The students, we have now the teachers who are very competent, we have now the digital content. Then we have to ask how we have to use these educational technologies for teaching and learning. And um, for me it's uh, rather easy. We are developing from the research point of perspective uh, for, I don't know, many many years now, many different uh, theoretical concepts. You see there is something like mobile learning, first century uh, digital skills, seamless learning, flipped classroom, um, whatever. So it's just a cloud where you can just see these keywords. And these are theoretical concepts. And what our goal now is to bring it to practice. And that is uh, the big difference because we know this theoretical concept and now we have to think which one of them are can be used in our lecture halls, can be used in our learning spaces or is in our online teaching and we have to bring it uh, really to the praxis. So we have these theoretical concepts from my perspective. Now we have uh, to think what we can do with them. Um, the first thing is, um, of course, we can use technologies just in classroom. Um, that means, um, as I'm working here now with the video, you can use your iPad, you can use a special tool, um, then you can write um, not on the blackboard, you can also write on this iPad. The students get, for example, your lecture notes uh, immediately after the lecture and um, you can record it, for example, and they get also a recording. You can, um, and you see here, for example, what have been done in uh, this lecture of architecture, um, where just um, this lecturer is providing some sheets uh, for the working sheets for the students and he's working with the iPad, with a pen and uh, drawing within this working sheet and afterwards all students get a recording and get as well also his digital content. Um, then you can do, for example, ebooks, as you see here. Um, the ebook is not only just a book, uh, you can see also here recording. That means uh, beside of the explanation, just in a written form, you get also an audio form uh, explanation of this content, for example. Or you can also use, for example, this feedbacker, as I'm doing here, remember you, you can give me feedback, um, where you can get uh, the voice of your audience. This is especially very interesting if you have very large or a huge class, for example, with 100 or more students, because you know that the interactivity is rather low, and there you can, um, and uh, then you can just use, for example, a so-called audience response system. That is if you use technologies right in the classroom. Um, the next thing is, of course, um, you can also use different kind of uh, information systems. Um, this information system is typical a uh, learning management system. The learning management system just um, help you to organize your course um, and to provide all the stuff you need also online. So we are, for example, using uh, Moodle as the biggest open source system. Um, at this world and where we provide uh, all students and we provide the courses and in these courses the students find the, their learning content, the materials, the lecturer notes as well as um, different things like uh, forming groups or something like that. And we have also a so-called video platform at Graz University of Technology. It's an open cast Matterhorn system uh, where we're providing uh, lecture recordings. Um, we provide also videos. We also provide streaming if it is necessary, for example. 
Yeah, and then uh, the next step is, so that means the first step was just enhancing the classrooms. The second is going online with your stuff. And then we have uh, didactical forms. Um, maybe the most oldest and most famous one is blended learning. That means um, that you are beginning to to change uh, between face-to-face uh, -face education and online education. That means that, for example, you have uh, you meet firstly online with your students. Um, then you get, uh, there is a presence, maybe a day or something like that, where you're working with them. Then it's again an online phase, then it's going to the presence. How often you change that and um, how long is just up to you. But this kind of didactical concept means blended learning. Um, another interesting uh, didactical concept, which is just, uh, I see, growing at the universities, even on our universities, flipped classroom. That is the idea that um, all what you do in face-to-face -face education is provided by video. So more or less the same as we are doing currently here. The input, where um, more or less no question um, happens normally, uh, you just provide to the students as video and say, okay, look at this video at home. Just um, just think about it and just uh, recognize that have um, is, is not not bad because um, you can say um, I can do it with better sound. You have um, you can choose it on at your time when you have time. You can concentrate on it and so on, and you can of course uh, look at it more than once. And um, when you have get this video based input from the lecturer, then you come to the face-to-face -face education in the classroom and there you are more or less doing question exercises interactions so no content no new content just exercising that what people were hearing answering the questions and something like that and of course that is also interesting especially for uh, technical education because uh, we all know that it's not a theoretical input this is uh, bringing this theoretical input in in practice to exercise on this calculation or something like that that is much more interesting because then really the questions happen and you as teachers are that are there and can just answer the question. So I see this uh, kind of flipped classroom or inverted classroom model comes rather popular right now because many people just see that it's a benefit for, for students to come to the university again. Of course, uh, the main work is uh, you have to do at least once this video input um, uh, beforehand. And um, if we just uh, think about um, flipped classroom, that means there is already or uh, at least also face-to-face uh, -face education. We can also think about poor online education. And that's what we are doing with uh, the so-called MOOCs, Massive Open Online Courses. Uh, we at Graz University of Technology are hosting the only uh, MOOC platform in Austria. It's called uh, iMOOCs. And, um, we have done now more than 50 uh, different kinds of massive open online courses. And uh, it looks more or less always the same. So you have a start page. In this uh, in this course, uh, you get on a weekly basis um, more or less a core video input. So similar to the flipped classroom. Then you get additional material. Um, you have to look at that. And you get a self-assessment where you can just uh, think, have or understand the main input from or the main issue of this uh, video. And after six, eight or ten weeks, um, if you have done all the self-assessments, you got just a certificate and uh, you have um, more or less done this kind of online course. And we are doing this in combination also with uh, university lectures. So that means that can be also a flipped classroom, for example, to say the video is just uh, provided as a MOOC and uh, you come to me and we are exercising. Or for my own lecture, I'm using also a massive open online course uh, because why, why I'm doing that, it's interesting that uh, I open it to the public because anyone can discuss on this um, topic. I'm um, teaching social aspects of in, uh, information technology. and. Um, my students have to do additional two written essays, um, but they, they, this uh, will be done on the learning management system. So it's just a combination. Um, why doing uh, Graz University of Technology MOOCs? Uh, because uh, we know that we are reaching a very broad audience. It's an audience we never would reach on the university. So uh, if you would like to have more than 1,000 students who are doing something like that, you should have to go to these MOOCs. Yeah? The MOOCs are the big challenges just we can hand um, 
So just we can handle more than 1,000 students in one course. And uh, it's also very interesting because it's a very fast knowledge transfer. We have always the problem, for example, in teacher education that we are currently uh, have to bring to our teachers outside um, a kind of knowledge and it it's just needs time. And if you are providing a massive open online course, we can do it in time, for example, to bring them a new programming language, a new tool, for example, 3D printers, make a education or something like that and um, of course we we after doing uh, so many MOOCs uh, we just thought that um, we are very flexible now because we have very many videos different videos we can use these videos in different situations for more than one MOOC we can use it in classroom and so on so we get uh, because we get now this digital learning content but I'm not told you before is that we are also providing all this stuff in this uh, MOOCs also as open education resource. So anyone can use every, every content uh, in how he would like to do that. Yes, and the last part I would like to talk about is a little bit uh, what we also learned from MOOCs, um, how learning and teaching is happening. Because as we have in the background uh, learning analytics running within the MOOCs and we are studying what happening, for example. You can see here um, just a widget where we are just studying um, how do a people posting in discussion forums. And uh, you would see there are more or less one, three, four or five people who are mainly doing the whole discussion. The rest is just uh, reading yeah, and just recognizing what is posted there. And we can, for example, you can also uh, talk about what is the logins over time. You see typically on Monday when the new uh, week is just um, available. The most uh, students are coming and um, and so on. So typical, you can also do it over the day. Then you see, for example, that in Austria, the sleep time is about 2 a.m. to 6 a.m. in the morning. Yeah, and um, we have also done uh, different projects and MOOCs and learning analytics. And um, there is the so-called Staler project. You can find it online. And uh, what is very interesting, for example, what uh, there was a study where we just uh, split it, uh, the groups of learners. And you see there is a different behavior. If you, for example, say there is a non-traditional study track and norm student and male, for example, or is a non-traditional study track and not norm student and male, so that makes a difference. So we see that within these groups, there are a different behavior. And uh, that is the possibility uh, that you get, for example, if you have huge data and you can analyze this data. And that is what we are thinking about learning analytics. Uh, that means that we are now thinking how we can also assist this kind of group. Yeah, um, that means the answer to the fourth uh, question is that an adequate use of these educational technologies increases the didactic diversity. That's, that's the main point. So you see, I have provided you a many kind of solution. You as lecturer should just uh, think about how can I use this educational technology that I can have the most benefit from. And I know some of you maybe are online teachers, some of you are face-to-face -face teachers, and uh, it's not good or bad. It's just as a, the technology can maybe help you all in the end. And uh, currently we see it's a matter of strategic implementation. So because we have these early adopters, uh, the early adopters have done this and we have experience from that. And now we have to bring it to the broad public. Yeah, um, in the end of a talk, I have to give you a reminder. So <laughs> a reminder that uh, innovation always means it's a hard way. And sometimes we don't see how it goes on and what also what would be possible if we just uh, doing that. Okay, um, thank you again um, for your attention. I hope um, it was um, interesting for you. You can uh, as well contact me, for example, uh, on this is my email address, this is my Twitter account, and uh, I will make also this slide available on my web blog, or uh, hopefully you give me also feedback. Have a good conference. Thank you. <music>